Good evening, good evening, good evening, everyone, and welcome to St. Fergus Baptist Church here in Marble Falls, where the Honorable George H. Perry is the pastor. I am Dennis Porter, the assistant pastor and your course facilitator. Tonight, we will be coming from Nehemiah 3, and the subject of our class is working together. Working together. Let us go to our Father in prayer. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, listen and do not delay for your city and your people that are called by your name. God, you are who you say you are. You can do what you say you can do. I am who you say I am. I can do all things through Christ. Your word is alive and active in me. Most high God, creator of the heavens and the earth and the fullness thereof, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, all there is, all there was, all there will be. The Almighty. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The giver of all good and perfect gifts. Abba, Abba, Abba. Father, shine your face upon us that we may be saved. For all have sinned and fallen short of your will and your glory. But hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. There is none greater than you. Father, we thank you for your grace, mercy, and love, your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, your joy, peace, and purity, courage, healing, and strength, abundance, awareness, and expansion. But most of all, Father, we thank you for your son, Yeshua, who went to the cross and shed his blood for the mission of our sin and the salvation of our souls. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that abides in us each and every day. Father, we pray for peace in Jerusalem. Father, we pray for the heads of state this evening, Father. Let there be peace throughout the land, Father. We pray for the president of this country, the governor of this state, the House and the Senate on both levels. We pray for the mayors of our local communities, the city councils, the school boards and the county governors, Father. Father, let your will be done in Europe. Let your will be done in Europe. Now, Father, we ask you to bless the shepherd of this flock. Keep him in your will that he may glorify your name. Our Father, I ask you to bless each and every one of us here tonight that came out to listen and learn of you. Father, speak to me, speak through me, that we shall go forth and do your will in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. All right. The name of the lesson is Working Together. There's an old African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, Go along. If you want to go far, go together. What might that mean when you think about that proverb? If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. What does that mean when you hear it? In life in general. Tired, you're doing it by yourself. That's what I see. You get tired? Okay. You because you're doing everything you by yourself. So you're going to get tired. You may do it faster, but you're going to be tired in the long run. Tired in the long run. So if um, whatever I'm working on or wherever I'm going, if I go by myself and I go real fast, I may. May get there or may not get there because I got to stop and rest. Yes. But if we go together, I can rest. And I can take over. You can take over. Hmm. It's amazing tired, how that I'll works. Huh? Like when you're tired, I'll pick up the cross and I'll carry it. It's amazing how that works. So maybe that's why. God created things in duality. He gave Adam and Eve. He made two of each animal. Just a thought. Two is better than one. <laughs> amen. Amen, Sister Dawn. Two is better than one. Two is better than one. Or have you heard the saying, many hands make light work? As long as everybody's doing the same work. 
If you ever get a chance to watch lemurs on an animal show, when they work together and they put those many hands together, they work together. If you see ants, the way ants work together, they build bridges with their bodies together to get across pools of water and take stuff back to the nest because they are concerned about the collective. All right. So now let's talk about the collective that Nehemiah had. Many times leaders have great vision of what they think should be done, but they don't have the commitment of the members of the group. A gifted leader can motivate others, but the job usually gets done because of prayer and unity among believers. This is primarily because the vision is spiritual and not material. This is primarily because I read that. When there is a lot of mundane work, like repairing a badly damaged wall, there must be unity for the job to get done. People need to feel they are a part of the process or they usually won't commit to the work. To miss this step of getting people on board dooms most projects to failure. Getting people on board. If you ever work for an organization that's been successful, you always hear them use the words, buy-in. The employees buy-in. Customers buy-in. In other words, we want everybody with the same mindset. If we have the same mindset, we can reach the goals that we have. If we don't have the same mindset, we're wasting time. It's like pouring water up a rope. All you get is wet. So now, for our group discussion, what are your thoughts when you are part, when you part way into a job you thought others were committed to, only find out that you're the only one that's committed to the task? This gets really personal for you, don't it? Yep. You might want to think about what you say if you say anything. You don't have to, because this not only covers jobs, it covers all aspects of life. It covers all aspects of life, working together. The ones cleaning up the rocks usually get bored. Yep, but that's probably one of the most important jobs. Whenever you clear the ground, that's probably one of the most important jobs, because a rock can tear up all the machines. You pick up rocks from this spot and move them to that spot. Yeah, that, that gets really exciting real quick. Done that a couple times. Didn't like it. So you find yourself in a job. You find yourself in a situation and you think that we're all committed. And then you find out in the middle of whatever it is you're doing, that there's not the same level of commitment by everybody. And when that happens, what do you usually find yourself doing? More work than is necessary on your part. You start to pick up somebody else's slack because they're not doing it. You start to, you start to go home tired, more tired than the one who stood around and drank coffee and smoke cigarettes and laugh the whole day while you worked. You begin to get stressed, you begin to get angry, you begin to get fed up. And guess what? That's human nature. That's human nature. How many of us really and truly want to, we all have a 50 pound bag to carry up a hill and now I'm with you, Sister Dawn, and Sister Christine. I give y'all 25 pounds each in my bag. And I just keep walking along and y'all carry the load. How fair is that? Exactly. Instead of carrying your 25, instead of carrying your 50, you now carry 75. And you carry 75. But when you divide 150 by 3, it's a much easier load to carry. Yep. 
So what motivates you to commit yourself to a group task that will take a lot of work? What motivates you? Sometimes you got to encourage yourself. You got to find out why you doing what you doing and if it's worth, and I say if it's worth, continuing to do it. Because sometimes you're in the middle of it and you're looking at it and you're wondering, why am I doing this? What's the point? What am I going to get out of this other than aggravate? When I was working in management, I would get so many calls from people saying that they were sick, and I knew they weren't sick, to the point I would just tell them, don't tell me you're sick, just tell me you ain't coming. Don't lie to me. Keep your credibility. Just tell me you ain't coming. I prefer you just tell me I'm not coming, whether you need to give me this long story about how your big toe got infected, cause your hair to fall out of your left ear, and your baby finger on your right hand is in a hangnail because the dog was barking all night. And that's a bit of an exaggeration, but I did get stories that went all the way around the world just to say, so I ain't gonna be there. Why didn't you just say, I ain't gonna be there. Amen. Do all things as if you were doing it for the Lord. But the problem with that is, Not that you're wrong. We got to ask the question though sometimes, who is the person serving? Who's their Lord? It's not a matter of are they serving God, but who is their Lord? All right, so let us take a listen to Nehemiah 3. About a five minute listen. Uh huh. Of David. After him, 
Nehemiah, the son of Asbach, ruler of half the district of Beth Zur, repaired to a point opposite the tombs of David, as far as the artificial pool, and as far as the house of the mighty men. After him the Levites repaired. Reham, the son of Bani, next to him, Ashabiah, ruler of half the district of Kila, repaired for his district. After him their brothers repaired. Babai, the son of Enadad, ruler of half the district of Kila. Next to him, Azair, the son of Jeshua, ruler of Mizpah, repaired another section opposite the ascent to the armory at the buttress. After him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, repaired another section from the buttress to the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. After him, Merimah, the son of Uriah, son of Hakaz, repaired another section from the door of the house of Eliashib to the end of the house of Eliashib. After him, the priests, the men of the surrounding area, repaired. After them, Benjamin and Ashab repaired opposite their house. After them, Azariah, the son of Masaiah, son of Ananiah, repaired beside his own house. After him, Benuai, the son of Hanadad, repaired another section from the house of Azariah to the buttress and to the corner. Halal, the son of Uzai, repaired opposite the buttress and the tower projecting from the upper house of the king at the court of the guard. After him, Pedaiah, the son of Parosh, and the temple servants living on Ophel repaired to a point opposite the water gate on the east and the projecting tower. After him, the Tekoites repaired another section opposite the great projecting tower as far as the wall of Ophel. Above the horse gate, the priests repaired, each one opposite his own house. After them, Zadok, the son of Amer, repaired opposite his own house. After him, Shemaiah, the son of Shechaniah, the keeper of the east gate, repaired. After him, Hananiah, the son of Shelemiah, and Hanan, the sixth son of Zalaf, repaired another section. After him, Meshalom, the son of Barakiah, repaired opposite his chamber. After him, Malkijah, one of the goldsmiths, repaired as far as the house of the temple servants and of the merchants opposite the muster gate, and to the upper chamber of the corner. And between the upper chamber of the corner and the sheep gate, the goldsmiths and the merchants repaired. All right, a lot of repair people. So who were the major groups? All the ones he just named. <laughs> Goldsmiths. Everybody but the noblemen who would not stoop before their God. If you paid attention to that. Everybody but the noblemen went out there and did their part. Men and women as well. Now, let's say we were there. What part of the fence, what, what part of the fence, what part of the wall would you want to work on? Pay attention to where each person or each group of people worked. So what part of the wall would you work on? Why the sheep gate? I like animals. Okay. All right, so the part of the wall you worked on would be something that is significant to you. Yep. Nehemiah went to the tomb opposite of David. Everybody else built part of the wall that was near to their house, near to where they lived. So if I was there building, I would want to build on something I can look outside and see too. Women too. Amen. Oh, we're going to get to we're going to get to woman's work. Don't worry about it. We're going to get to woman's work, so you might as well get your shoes on and get out the kitchen. <laughs> what, were our, what were the occupations? Priest. Priest. Okay. Goldsmith. You said you would like the sheep gate. Uh, you, you like animals too? <laughs> or does it just sound easy? No. Perfumers. Perfumers. Half the district, that's the governor. Okay. Governors. Yes, governors, the leaders. Um, their children. Their children. Perfumer, gold, goldsmith, the men of Jericho. Everybody except the nobles. So from the chapter, what seems to be the motivation for the people to work on their part of the wall? Would, so they could see it because it was close to them. So they could see it because it was close to them, 
Or as for you, you said you like the sheep gate because you like animals. Because it was significant to them. It was significant to them. The priests, in verse 28, the priests made repairs each opposite of their own house. Why? For the sake of time, they ain't have far to go. If, I'm, if, I'm, if I live here, I just grab my tools, walk out, do my thing, go back home. Second, it would ensure excellent if a man fixing the wall was outside of his own house. In other words, where are you going to put your best effort at? Home. Are you going to build a part of the fence for me as you will as well for your own self? Some people will. Some people are going to do just enough to get it done. But if it's outside security, exactly. Exactly, Sister Dora. So if this wall is by my house, I don't want them folks coming from the outside in. So I'm going to make sure there ain't no holes in the wall. Make sure all the mud, the, the mortar is dry and the bricks are in place. I'm taking care of my family because this is where we are. So that area becomes very significant to you. Look at verse 5. What does it say about the attitude of some people? Verse 5. Mm. No traffic jam. <laughs> what do you mean traffic jam? <laughs> Avoiding traffic jams by working close to the house? Okay. The nobles would not stoop to help. Wherever you are, when you have that person or you have that group of people that refuse to be a part of the team effort, they are above the work being done. What does that say? And next to them, the Tukamites, the Tukamites repaired. But their nobles would not stoop to serve their Lord. What would you think if you were in the middle of a crisis situation where all hands were on, where all hands were needed, and somebody stood by and said, I'm, no, I'm not doing that. That work is beneath me. How would you feel about that person? Disappointed. That's all? You good. <laughs> you good. I'd be disappointed, but I think I'd also be, if you needed help, then I'm not about to go help you because you, you can't help us. Why do I need to surrender myself to help you? I'd be I see what you're saying. No, but I, know that ain't right. I think within that time of day, he'll be pitching his tent outside the wall. Because if that wall ain't finished, we're all in danger. Yeah, that, that's one way of looking at it. <laughs> they think they're better than us. Okay, so now let's let's move up to 2022. Mm -hmm. You go to work. There's a rupture in the wall. You got water, and this happened. You got water leaking everywhere. Water rolling down the hall. Let Move the food out. Move out the way, fool. <laughs> you got water rolling down the hall, and then you got folks talking about, I can't get my shoes wet. Let's take off the shoes. But then you have the supervisor that come in, grabs a mop and a bucket, and gets the mopping and, and moving water just like everybody else. What do you think of that supervisor? How would you feel if you were in a bad, go cook some food. <laughs> How would you feel if you were in a bad, bad situation? Outside of that, that's somebody I can count on. That's somebody I can count on. That's somebody I wouldn't mind being in a foxhole with. Because I know they're going to do their part. 
Now, do they have to do it every day? No. Or when you know it's a bad situation? When it counts. When it counts. All right. So we have this pastor. I'm going to pick on <laughs> We have this pastor who we constantly tell him, go sit down. Go be the pastor. No, I can't do that. The work needs to be done. Go sit down. The doctor said you can't do this. The doctor don't know what he's talking about. I'm not a good patient. I'm not a good patient. And I, I wish I was making this up, but we've had these conversations. <laughs> what did the doctor tell you? Go sit down. I remember one night I was driving past. Somebody was emptying a van. And I had no business emptying the van. I stopped. What are you doing? Uh, uh, where are you supposed to be at? Okay. Well, no, he was actually supposed to be someplace else, but he was here working. Instead of delegating the work that needed to be done. I, I'm not going to call no names, George H. Perry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, he is a good man. He is a good man. But sometimes a good man and or a good woman needs to stop and let somebody else carry the load. Don't mean you don't have no input, but sometimes you need to step back. But don't be like those nobles. Well, I'm not doing that because I'm better than you. We, we will never be able to say that our pastor thinks he's better than anybody. He does everything around here for me. I stop drains to cook, to preach. He does everything. Literally. So that's a man I wouldn't mind going to war with. So, all right, now, women. I seen Pastor pick it up roofing material that fell on the road. That's right. Women, go get your shoes on, get out the kitchen. Verse 12. Next to him, Shalom, the son of Hazelash, the ruler of Hazel district, repaired he and his daughters. I was talking to a young lady today, told me she knew how to change her uh, Water pump and a radiator. I don't. <laughs> so guess who I'm gonna call next time I need a starter, alternator, or a radiator, all that repair. And I'm not gonna be embarrassed about it. That's not my lane. I don't know that. So the bottom line is, no one said. It is a chauvinistic, misogynistic idea that you have to be in the kitchen. You have to have no shoes. When the wall of God's sacred city was being rebuilt, Shalom's daughters made repairs. God called women in his kingdom to have strategic positions of responsibilities that must be acknowledged and must be respected. The strengths of a godly woman are not to be ignored or bypassed, but utilized. If you have a woman in your midst that can repair a car and you don't know how, don't tell her go cook you no eggs while you sit out there and scratch your head and can't do it. Let her do what she does. God didn't get, when God put Eve in the Adam, when God put Eve in the garden, he did not tell Eve to cook. He said, you are his help mate. Or as some people say, help meet. Because in order to get to where you're going, you have to meet. We would be foolish, very foolish, if we did not recognize, 
honor, and respect those abilities. There are folks that don't want a woman doctor. The best doctors that I've had in my life have all been women. Maybe it's because of the maternal instincts. Maybe they thought I was cute. But I think it was mostly the maternal instincts. <laughs> where they care about their patients. Where a male doctor, he might take your blood pressure, he might touch you. Otherwise, he's just gonna ask you some questions and sit on the computer and write down what you say. But that woman is gonna put her hands on you and she gonna feel for herself. So no, you don't get to take off your shoes and be barefoot in the kitchen. Unless you want to go work, then go home and take off your shoes. That's your choice. But a requirement, that is not your requirement. That is not what you're supposed to do. So, what are the principles of the divisions of labor that you see in this chapter? Who is doing what, where, when, and how? The division of labor. You ever want to get a big fight in the house? I don't take out the garbage. That's a man's job. I don't wash dishes. That's a woman's job. It's a woman's job to do laundry. It's a man's job to cut grass. Huh? I prefer the male work than the female work. Why? Because I'm not the typical female. I don't want to be in the kitchen doing the cleaning and all that when I feel I'm better off doing it. Doing the other work. Oh, so you got skills. Yeah. And you want to use the skills that you were given. That In other words, And that you were taught. So in other words, you want to be true to your true nature. Yes. So if that's not, and, and what we do a lot of times, regardless of male or female, we try to put people in positions that are not their true nature. In other words, parents don't swim. When you see a pair of swimming, let me know. Parrots don't swim. Now, dolphins fly, but they fly in the water. You're not going to see a dolphin higher than 20 feet. And it's only for a short time. When you hear the story about the scorpion and the frog, the frog said, I'll give you a ride across the back, and they got across the uh, river, and so they got in the middle of the scorpion stung. Frog looked back and said, Mr. Scorpion, you said you wasn't going to do that, but I'm a scorpion. That's my nature. So the nobles apparently had a nature that they didn't bow, and they were better than everybody else. And as Pastor said, they need to sleep on the outside of the, on the, outside of the, the wall since they got their own independent nature that you cannot work with the rest of us, sleep by yourself. They society to be a Exactly. So, now, have we seen this principle applied in Christian circles? Have we seen this principle applied in Christian circles? The principle of working together, the principle of having somebody who doesn't pull their weight. Yep. Both, both. <laughs> <laughs> yep, you hit that right on the head. You hit that right on the head. You've seen both. There's always a core group. I don't care where you go. If it's on a job, you got this core group that the supervisor is going to go to when he know he needs something done and he wanted it done right the first time. She wanted it done right the first time. She know who she's going to. And if you know that the supervisor knows something that he can take and ain't got to worry about it, oh, let me, let me call Dennis. I ain't got to worry about it. He'd be out of my way, and I ain't got to hear him talk all day. Well, I need this done. Let me call George. He's going to get it done. He's going to be done right the first time. And I ain't got to check on him. But I'm going to have to check on Dennis every 10 minutes to make sure he ain't going someplace else. Oh, y'all ain't never seen people like that? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I'm like that. <laughs> I'm like that. Five minutes into doing the job, he's like, what am I supposed to be doing again? 
So yeah, in Christian circles, we see it all the time. You got that core people, that core group of people, you give them the mission and leave them alone. We should do what we are best at. Amen. Amen. You give people what they are best at. Construction is not my best field. So guess what you ought not have me building? Much of anything. I can figure it out. I'm going to give it my best. But that's not my strong suit. What am I best at? Teaching. Studying and learning. How did I get this way? Year after year after year after year of teaching. I didn't just start doing this the other day. I've been God prepared me for this years ago. Usually, a natural progression in completing the project is prayer, vision, strategy, developing unity among the members, and doing the work. Have you seen the progression of this work in any groups that you've been a part of? It's a lot of prayer. There's <laughs> a lot of prayer and there's a vision. Now, what's so what's so what's what's so unique about the mission outreach? There's prayer. The vision doesn't change. What changes? strategy. You have to change the strategy. For example, before the pandemic, every Tuesday and Thursday, you come in, get your place, sit down and socialize. Pandemic hit. Oh, we changed players. When do service only? Now we're in the endemic. Come in, eat if you want to, leave if you want to. But you have both options available. What's the vision? Feed people in the community that's hungry. That has not changed. But the strategy changed because of the playing field. Now, developing unity among the members and getting the work done. Because the strategy changed, you have to change players. Because some of us were not physically able to be in contact with people at the window because of the success then the accessibility of contracting the virus. Well other of us others of us primarily me could be at the window and didn't worry about it. And for some reason I could pick up on folks coming up the stairs. Yeah I need to put my mask on. Mm, not this one. Yep, let me double mask on this one. The Spirit was speaking to me and intuitively guiding me on who you need to talk to, who you need to talk to, who you need to get in and get out as quick as possible. Who you need to take the food outside to and not let them come through the door. So that was that was developing the the working environment for that amongst the members. And did anybody question what I did? You got it figured out, leave them alone. Do I mess with Deacon Jackson in the kitchen? Not at all. It ain't safe. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't safe. We work together with the same mission, the same vision, but each one of us have our different parts. And then after things settled for a while, I was able to step away, go do something else, and come back. And then doing the work. The strategy changed again. Pastor Perry got sick. Some things changed around. So now I'm doing some things that we talked about. He said, no, you don't need to do that. And guess what? I told him I shouldn't be doing it in the first place. But I ain't going to say I told you so. <laughs> I'm picking on him because I love him. If I didn't love him, I wouldn't say nothing to him. I just looked at him and said, mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So, does your church or fellowship utilize many of its members in the work? Why? Why not? But like you know, like we said, the strategy changes. 
and because of the way we're situated with the work that we do, better not. <laughs> okay, Sister Dora. <laughs> because of the way we are situated here, we have a core group of people that work. And we have some that come in when they're available. And we have some that's available that just don't come. But it's okay. The will of God will be done. And like I said, sometimes I'm in, sometimes I'm out. But when I am needed here, it doesn't matter what I thought I was doing. I find myself here. And I will tell you, it is divine intervention every time. It is divine intervention every time. Coming up to um, last last year, October, September, coming into this year, God knew what was coming. And I was getting very uncomfortable where I was. So I had to move from where I was to be here when things began to happen that were happening. I had to be prepared emotionally, physically, spiritually, and I had to be given the knowledge that I needed in order to step into the pastor's position while he was taking care of himself. Now, if you had asked me in September why I was leaving while I was working, I'd just tell you, I can't do this no more. But now in March, I can tell you exactly why I had to leave that place in order to be here for when things change. If you think things are a coincidence in life, a coincidence, whatever you want to call it, nothing just happens. God is a master planner. God is a master planner. We plan checkers. He plan chess. How has cooperation played a significant part in your church and your fellowship for groups? Success in ministry. Sometimes there's so much love flying around the table, I don't know what to do. We are a close knit group. We are a close knit group. We all have our issues. We all have our issues. I know I like to be independent, I like to do my own thing sometimes. We have a pastor that ain't going to depend on nobody because God told him this is what he want done. He's going to make sure that God's, God works get done. He ain't going to depend on nobody else to do it. Doors closed and bigger doors open. Amen. Amen. I'm glad you said that. When doors close, when we are obedient, when we are obedient to God's word, when he moves us from one place, to another place. And when we are obedient, a bigger door opens. Or, in other words, we are what he wants us to be when he wants us to be there. And then, because of your diligence, your faithfulness, he's going to reward you for that. God is not like working at Walmart or working for some company here. You spend 23 years at that company and you never get a promotion. God give you subtle promotion and you don't even realize that you're getting promoted. I had a prayer when I was working at Travis County. The prayer of Jabez. Lord, enlarge my coats and keep me from all evil. Next thing I know, I didn't have a job at Bell County no more. <laughs> but now, I was telling Pastor Perry this week, I was invited to come to Pakistan to preach. Has my coast been enlarged? Yes. I've been invited to Pakistan, Africa. I have no clue how or why 
but those doors are now open. Because I was where God wanted me to be when he wanted me to be there. Am I going to Pakistan? That's a good question. I ain't in no hurry. <laughs> I'm not gonna pull a, um, I'm not gonna pull a Jonah, huh? I'm not gonna pull a Jonah, but uh, just being what God told you to be, when those doors close, other doors open. You might not see the blessing in the beginning. But when he opens the when the when the, when the windows of heaven open, and he start pouring out blessings, get the next to somebody that's getting blessed, because it's gonna fall on you too. You might not get <laughs> you might not get a Lamborghini, but you might get a brand new Volkswagen, which is easier to take care of than a Lamborghini. Do you feel you are motivated to work in your church or fellowship as much as this group of people is? Explain your response. Do you feel motivated to do what you do like that group of people that we were dealing with that we were talking about? Everybody, even the nobles who refused to buy, who refused to stoop, they were motivated in their actions. They were motivated. Yes. Yes. Why do you feel like an outsider? You don't feel like an outsider. Why is that important? Because if you are somewhere where you don't feel like you're wanted, you choose not to work. You don't want to work. Amen. I don't want to be around nobody that don't want me around. Amen. Love is a motivator. And who's the greatest motivator? The most high. Why? He's all love. Even when we don't even when we can't see what he's doing, it's being done in love. He's shutting doors for us because I got something better for you. We settling for, well, I was going to say a cheeseburger. <laughs> but he's got a, a New York strip in his mind. But as you say, we settle for mediocrity. What excellence should be our goal. Thank you for your time and help with the word of God. You know, I told you about the prayer of Jabez and where I ended up. So thank God for me being here. I asked for him to enlarge my coast and promote me. I got promoted. I got promoted. And I'm happy for it. But without y'all, y'all make me study. Y'all make me read. And if I don't read and if I don't study, I don't grow. So this is one of those things where we talked about last week. When one of us go up and we pull somebody else up, that pushes us up because we got to move out the way so you can come up. But we both can't. We both cannot occupy the same spot. I got to get out that spot so you can get in it. So that means I got to move up. All right. Next week. This is going to be fun. Opposition from the outside. Nehemiah chapter 4. We always got somebody on the outside trying to tell us what to do. Have no idea what they're talking about, but they're going to tell you how to run your life. So let's apply that, that thought process to working together and how you live your life, because somebody always trying to tell you how to live and have no clue what's going on in your house. Pastor, you got anything? No, sir. You said it all. It's, it's a blessing to have them here. And we're going to, hopefully, our prayer, we're going to have a bigger group. Amen. Amen. We 
let us go to our Father in prayer. God, you are who you say you are. You can do what you say you can do. Lord, we thank you for your visit tonight. We thank you for touching our hearts, souls, and minds, opening us up to receive of you. Father, I ask you to bless each and every person that receives this tonight. Father, touch their hearts, souls, and minds. Give them what they stand in need of in the name of Jesus. We pray. Amen, amen, and amen. All right, y'all. We'll see y'all Monday. Monday, we'll be talking about money again. Miss Heather Weaver Parsons will be back. We will be looking at um, Dave Ramsey. We'll be playing a game on how to settle, how to resolve debt. And we are going to do some basic budget planning. Let's talk about money. Going to God Real Talk on Monday. See you then. All right. Bye.